Hello again and welcome to another Mordian Glory Warhammer 40k video. In today's episode, we are going to talk about what I think is the most important factor in a game of Warhammer 40k. The number one thing you need to know going into a matchup, be it competitive or casual. And that thing is terrain. You might think that putting the right units in your list is the most important. And it is, a, it is an important thing, but it's not the most important thing. You might think that picking the right weapons and the right leaders is the most important thing. And they are important, but they're not more important than terrain. You see, before you even put, well, if you're a dinosaur like me, pen to paper when you're writing your army. Before you even decide what faction you might want to take to a tournament, if you have the luxury of picking for more than one, the number one factor that you need to know, that you need to understand, that you need to be aware of when you go into a game, when you sign up to a tournament, is going to be what terrain they are using. Now, if you're new to Warhammer 40k, you might think that, well, terrain is just terrain. And you know what? You're not alone in that mindset. Many, many people treat terrain as an afterthought if they think about it at all. And it took me the longest time in the world. It took me forever to understand the nuance of terrain and how important it was, how impactful it was on my games and now whenever i go to a tournament, whenever i sign up to an event the first thing that i do before i start writing my list before i start coming up with my game plan go to the rules pack and find out what terrain they are using attention guardsmen the commissariat has detected you have not yet liked this video do so immediately or else you will face the empress wrath and anyone who has not yet subscribed to the channel will be transferred to the penal battalions. That is all. Move out! You see, I have learned from bitter experience. I have taken a list to one tournament and it has done really, really well. And then just a couple of weeks later, I've gone to another tournament and the same list has struggled in every single game. And it has come down to almost exclusively the different terrain that I have been playing on at those two different events. Now, I appreciate I've been kind of vague up until this point, just saying that terrain is important, but not really explaining why. So let me get into the nitty gritty. Let's do a bit of a deep dive on why terrain can be so damn impactful. First and foremost, Terrain affects your army list. It affects what units are going to do well and what units are going to do poorly. For example, you may go to a game or have a casual battle or go to a local RTT and the terrain they use is pretty custom. They took a few ruins out there, a few forests out there. They make sure there's at least some way you can hide some key units, but by and large, it's fairly chill. In those kind of environments, you'll find that line of sight blocking isn't really such a big deal and you can pretty much see what you want to see and you can shoot what you want to shoot. In that environment, you'll find that shooting armies will really dominate. And so not only is it going to affect the units that you want to bring, because you're going to say to yourself, well, I can just take lots of tanks, I can have Lehman Russes, I can have Rogal Dawns, and I can just blast away, but it's also going to potentially affect the armies you're likely to face off against and the army that you're going to want to bring. If you're playing on a relatively open map, having an assault army or even including assault units is probably a disadvantage because they're just going to get destroyed before they ever make it across the table. But getting into a big old firefight, picking a faction like Tau or Guard or Eldar, they're pretty shooty, though of course Eldar can do a bit of everything, they are a very good faction. Those and Marines, they're quite shooty, or some of their armies are. But the point is that you're going to go down the Dakar route because it's going to be rewarding on that table to do so. But... If you take that list, and let's use guard as an example, and you've just got infantry and tanks, you've not worried about having any silence, deep striking, you've not really worried about having any artillery, you're just like, I like me Lima Russes, I like me Deathcore, I'm going Krieg style, I'm just marching across and shooting. 
you take that list that suddenly did really well and was shooting the crap out of people at the last game and you now go into a UKTC or WTC style terrain map. These are competitive layouts and we'll get into them a little bit more in a moment. Well, these have a lot of ruins and they have a lot of line of sight blocking. And suddenly you can't see very much. And suddenly those assault units that last time you decimated before they even got near you are tearing you up because they've been able to go from terrain piece the terrain piece you've not been able to engage them and they have reached your lines pretty much intact you've taken exactly the same list but due to a factor that has almost nothing to do almost not in your control your army is performing radically differently and in that situation taking lots of tanks wasn't the right answer in that situation Going for more artillery would have been much better because you know what? Then you can sit your artillery behind your own line of sight blocking terrain and shoot at enemy units as they come up the board. They can't hide from you. Maybe in that situation, you're like, oh, I don't want as much infantry. Infantry's just going to die before it gets anything done. But Bulgrins would be good in that situation because not only can they take a punch, but they can also deliver one as well. But it's not just necessarily about how much damage your units are going to do terrain could also impact how many points you need to spend on units that can hold objectives 40k is fundamentally a game about standing on circles and he who can stand on the circles the most efficiently can often be the one that wins the game if you're playing on an open map you're going to need units that can stand on an objective and take a punch no good wandering your five intercessors out into no man's land just to have them mown down by a chaos predator but you could take that same intercessor unit and put it in a transport and then drive it onto an objective that when the enemy destroys your the impulsor or your rhino whatever it may be you've gone for your infantry can spill out and yeah you've lost a transport but the objective remains in your control or you could go for Rather than taking a little 10-man Garzan squad, go for a 20-man Krieg blob with a Deathcore Marshal in there. If the terrain is open, you're probably going to have to put more points into holding units. But if the terrain is very, very dense, then you might get away with some very cheap 5 or 10-man just chaff units. Suddenly, those five incests before that you were having to invest up to a 10-man squad or swap out for something else entirely... Suddenly that cheap little squad is perfect. Why have a unit that's dialed up to the nines, that's filled up to the gills with all of its special equipment and characters, if a little five-man unit can sit behind a ruin on an objective and hold it? That's a much more efficient way of holding the objective. But wait, there's more, because terrain is also going to determine maneuverability. If you have a relatively more open board, then vehicles and monsters will be able to get around more easily. They'll be able to travel in straighter lines. As a result, you'll get the most out of their 10 inch or 12 inch movement. But if you're playing on a very dense map, you might find that those vehicles and monsters are really struggling. There might be a lot of walls that they can't get through. There might be a lot of turning and pivots, which are taking those vital inches off your movement. And I have been in events, I've been in games, where my transports have moved slower than my infantry. So my infantry could just breach through one wall and then the next and then the next. And my vehicles have to go all the way around. But it's not just maneuverability in a straight line. You've also got the fact that there is traffic jams. If you play on very urban maps, you will find that you can't just make a wall of tanks and move across in an unbroken line across the map. Rather, you will find your Chimeras and Russes bunching up into narrow columns, all trying to go in the same direction. This is going to detrimentally affect your force concentration. I've done videos on how important that is, but fundamentally, it's just going to slow you down and movement wins games. It's one thing that I think a lot of newer players don't really appreciate. They look at the big guns, they look at the armor, but they don't look at that movement stat. Movement is the most important thing on a unit's data sheet. Anything else. Because movement wins games. Movement allows you to get 
secondary objectives you might not otherwise be able to get, such as behind enemy lines and engagement on fronts. It allows you to get to objectives that otherwise you might not be able to, and put it on primary. All of this scores you points. Points means prizes. Understanding how important terrain is, is all well and good. But I guess the big question is, how do you know what terrain is going to be like in a game or at a tournament? Well, if you're playing a more casual game, maybe it's just a one-off against a friend or down the local game club, you should be aware of the kind of terrain that you're likely to encounter. If it's your first time going to a club and you've no idea what to expect, there's not much you can do about it rather than just go down, play and get an idea from it firsthand. But when it comes to tournaments, it's a different kettle of fish. Most TOs will put in their rules pack or on the Facebook page or wherever they're hosting the event, some details about the counter terrain you can expect. It's generally accepted good practice. This might be as simple as one line. Terrain will be light. Terrain will consist of forest craters and ruins. But there are also some specific terrain layouts and terrain maps that a lot of events have started using. These are standardized and you can actually know exactly what the terrain is going to look like and its layout before you even play the game. Before you even turn up, a lot of TOs will say we're playing on this kind of map in this round with this mission. In the UK, there are about four accepted different terrain formats. This very well may be different in the US and it might also be different in Europe and Australia. And there are also loads and loads of organizations that are pushing their terrain maps as the best. But like I said, in the UK, terrain tends to fall into about four different set formats. The first one is UKTC. You'll find this at events like the London Grand Tournament and the Manchester GT and stuff like that. This terrain is almost exclusively made up of ruins and there tends to be quite a lot of them. But whilst it is dense and you will need indirect fire, the movement channels are not completely restrictive. You will be able to bring things like Super Heavy, you will be able to bring things like your Land Raider or your Rogal Dawn and it'll be able to get out of your deployment zone but you will have a lot of land site blocking terrain that will need to be taken into account when you're picking units to push forward and units to shoot over the top of it. After this, we have WTC terrain, and this is by far the most dense. WTC describes terrain maps as light, medium, and heavy. I describe them as dense, very dense, and oh God, are we playing on a game map or is it just unbroken seas of L-shaped ruins? When playing on a WTC board, Line of sight is at a premium. You're going to need indirect fire. You're going to need combat units. Ironically, though, just a little heads up, sometimes the heavy terrain maps have really good firing lanes. There's not many of them, but the ones that they have can be very potent. So direct fire is still possible. But yeah, you're going to need to be ready for close encounters. The third terrain format that you might encounter is glass hammer. I really like this terrain format. I think it's a nice mixture of ruins and other things like forests and craters. WTC, UKTC, it's all just ruins. It might be a three-story ruin, it might be a one-story ruin, but it's all just ruins. Glasshammer is a mixture of different terrain types, and this means that you'll have like Ruins on the flank, so advancing up there can be quite advantageous if you've got assault units. But then the middle of the board might be a bit more open with some forest that you'll get the benefit of cover from, but you will be able to be seen. This means that whenever I've played in it, I've had some quite fun and thematic tank duels of tanks versus monster battles happen in the middle, whilst infantry and elites are skirmishing on the flanks. So I'm a big fan of Glass Hammer. Some people think it's a bit open and favors shooting armies a bit much, and I can see that, but I find that it's a little bit more interesting and enjoyable to play on rather than just ruins, ruins, ruins. And finally, we have, of course, Games Workshop. At the beginning of 10th edition, GW did something which I don't think they've done before, at least not in a very long time, and they released a whole suite of recommended terrain layouts combined with points level recommendations and also combinations of primary mission and mission rules. 
you'll find all of these terrain maps on the GW website. And they mostly consist of, by and large, lots of ruins on big square bases. This just scratches the surface, but hopefully it will give you an idea of what to expect from some of the common terrain maps and formats out there. But there is one more kind of terrain that we've not talked about, and it's a biggie. It's player place terrain. Player place terrain is very common in the US. You don't really get it almost at all over here in the UK, but you will see it at big events such as LVO over in the United States. I have to admit up front, in the interest of being transparent, I do not like player place terrain. Some people swear by it. Some people say it is the superior way of placing terrain. But I have to say, back in sort of 6th and 7th edition, we used to have player place terrain in the UK, and it was a nightmare. And over the course of 8th and 9th and 10th edition, stand terrain mats have become the go-to. And maybe it's an indication that 140k editions have got better. Maybe it was just an indictment of what Warhammer was like back in 6th and 7th. But the more that we have marched towards set terrain over the player place the more i have enjoyed the competitive scene of 40k but whether i like it or not is almost irrelevant you need to be aware of how player place works so you can take it into account essentially there will be a number of pieces of terrain available to both players you might find you have a couple of big ruins maybe a forest but there will be between i say four and six bits of terrain that each player will be able to place down there are lots of different ways of placing player terrain, but the more common one is where you can place it in your half of the board. Now, what this can mean is players can try and use the terrain to create a little bunker to try and hide something they use behind. Uh, they can try and up to a point uh, make terrain so you can jump from one to the other if you're an assault army. However, what you tend to find is overwhelmingly Player place terrain favors shooting armies like no other. And he who has the greatest firepower tends to win in a matchup on player place. And the simple reason is if you have more firepower than your opponent, what you will do is place your terrain down so that it will stop you from getting alpha striked, but then you'll just leave a big, nice, open killing ground in the middle. And your opponent can't do much about it because they can't put their player place terrain in your half. They can't put it bang in the, across the middle line. Instead, it tends to be a little bit back from the middle point. So there's always going to be a bit of a no man's land. And therefore, someone's going to have to move out first. Someone's going to have to blink first. And if you've got more firepower, if you've got a bit of indirect that can force your opponent's hand then you will force your opponent to start moving out. The moment they do, you're going to start blasting them. You've also got the fact that you need to move out to be able to take things like prime objectives. If you're playing with uh, tactical secondaries, you might have to go and take uh, no man's land. You might have to extend your battle lines. You might have to cleanse. The moment you do, you're just going to get blown off the table because there's no cover in the middle. Player place is really good for things like guard super heavies that tend to be very big which can struggle even on light set terrain maps like uktc well light ish in the case of uktc but uh on player place you just make sure there's a gap for your super heavy to go down you make sure there's a gap for your shadow sword to sit there and just bombard anything that dares poke its head above the parapet long story short if you know you're going into player placed, then be ready for a firefight more than a knife fight. And that, ladies, gentlemen, a small for creatures from Alpha Centauri, is a pretty high level overview of terrain, its impact, how important it is, and the different types you are likely to encounter. But this is only the beginning. It is the tip of the iceberg. Trade is a really, really big topic. And there's so many different little nuances and factors that you want to take into account. So I highly encourage everyone who has watched this video to comment down below. If you think I've missed something, if there's a little impact that I've not taken into account, please let me know. Share 
that notch. If there's another format that you think that's kind of up and coming that people should be aware of, get it down in that comment section. And of course, if you've got any questions, put them down there. Either myself or I'm sure someone else from this fantastic community will do their best to answer it and get back to you. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure that you smash that like button. It really does help. It boosts the video hugely with the algorithm. And naturally, if you never want to miss an episode, make sure to subscribe as well. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more doing glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patrons these are the war masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. To a heartfelt thank you to Alex Dengal, Bon Bon Vert, Mad Larkin, Marcus Roberts, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Wolf, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video. And of course, as always, see you guys next time.